welcome to the Monday edition of DC Today. This is one of those rare times I was thinking about this. If it's the second, it might be the third time ever where I'm recording just before the market is closed. I know I did it in Washington, DC actually a month ago, but I'm not sure if it's ever happened other than that. But the reason is just that as I'm literally sitting here recording, it's 10 minutes until the market close, but I have to go into a meeting right at one o'clock. So I'm doing this now. And, you know, maybe the market will go up 500 points in the last five minutes or it'll go down a thousand points or something. But I don't think so. I think we kind of have a general feel for where we are in the day. And if anything goes off from there, then it's just simply because of trying to record a few minutes prematurely. The data, the numbers, the closing figures in the written DC today will all be the final ones. And there is, as is often the case Monday, uh, a full length DC today covering our, our normal categories. And I just figured I'd go through some of that content with you right now. Um, you know, the futures opened up last night, Sunday, uh, up about 40 points. And by the time I went to bed, they were down 80. And then they were up about 50 points at 3.30 in the morning Pacific time. Then the market opened down 100 points. And uh, as we sit here right now, the Dow is down about 40. Um, the S&P is up about a third of a percent. And the NASDAQ is up about 0.8%. You're having a good day in some of those big tech companies that have been struggling lately. So um, markets, you know, from a Dow standpoint, it's kind of within the last 24 hours been anywhere from down 100 to up 100 and everywhere sort of in between. Not, not a lot of movement, not a lot of excitement. We're on the other side of the bulk of earnings season. We're on the other side of CPI. You're a good six weeks still from the next Fed meeting. And so, you know, uh, I don't anticipate there being a whole whole lot of drama. Speaking of that uh, Q2 earnings season, we started off with uh, consensus expectations that the earnings were going to be down about 5.7% year over year, which was itself significantly better than what had been expected six months earlier people say why did the market do so well at the earnings season it looks like we're going to end up down earnings being 3.8 percent lower than they were a year ago so the number that was already much better than previously expected ended up uh being worse than what things actually were uh, earnings doing better than expected even as they were just barely down year over year uh you had 79 percent of companies outperform what was their expectation Normally, you have about 65, 66% do so. And so you just kind of had companies that had come into earnings season a little overly cautious and real life results ended up doing better than had been anticipated. On the news cycle, I think we're all aware of the tragedy going on in Maui. Um, you're, you're at uh, roughly 100 lives lost already, making it the, the deadliest uh, natural wildfires uh, in over 100 years in our country. Uh, the repair recovery costs are expected to be uh, north of $5 billion. So major story there in terms of the recovery aspect of what will take place in this tragedy in, in Maui. Um, I, I stay away. First of all, I can't on a daily basis in D.C. today go into all of the new stuff with Hunter Biden, the Joe Biden investigation stuff, the um, Donald Trump's different arrests and indictments. I just I barely ever touch it in D.C. today because I think you guys hear about it plenty other places. I'm sure that if I talk about either side of these things long enough, I will end up offending somebody. And I really don't want to talk about any of it at all, ever. Um, but from a newsworthy standpoint, a special counsel being investigated, uh, excuse me, being opened up on Friday is, is certainly newsworthy um, on this uh, Hunter Biden uh, investigation. Uh, the U.S. Attorney from Delaware, David Weiss, being appointed special counsel. Special counsels are becoming much less special than they used to be, just very frequent. Um, you, big news story over the weekend. It's hit markets throughout today and not hit in a negative way, but I think it's substantial, even though these are not involving companies that we own at our firm. Uh, but U.S. Steel, which actually we did own U.S. Steel um, 15 years ago. A little, no, it was after financial crisis, so... Let's call it 14 years ago, but U.S. Steel, uh, one of the oldest companies in the, that had been in the Dow, you know, for a long, long time, um, got an unsolicited bid from a competitor, Cleveland Cliffs, and they rejected it. But you know, there's negotiations and things going on there. And the reason I bring it up is because of my 
theme about China, about reshoring, about onshoring, about factory manufacturing, and and the two. If Cleveland Cliffs and U.S. Steel came together, it would be a steel production behemoth. Where right now, all the largest steel production companies in the world are, are pretty much in China. Um, so we'll we'll follow that more. Speaking of which, the Biden administration, just on the public policy front, did go forward with their limits on investment in China. Uh, more cautious in these uh, restrictions than many had wanted, but nevertheless uh, enough to get some real retaliation threats from uh, Chinese leaders and effectively, you know, putting into this what amounts to capital controls in a lot of ways against China. And and I think that the the legislation is going to be interesting how it plays out in, um, uh, you know, kind of unintended consequences. We, we shall see. Um, okay, on the economic front, producer price indexes came out Friday. So you had the CPI covered in Thursday, but then PPI came and uh, prices were up a whopping 0.8% year over year, less than 1%. Uh, prices for intermediate processed goods are down 7.8% year over year. So on a wholesale level, you do have some real deflation. Um, the University of Michigan Consumer Conference number, which I never care about, it's uh, well, probably most prominently known consumer indicator came out Friday and it was at 71.2. So it was down a whisker from the 71.6 of last month, but both months pretty meaningfully, you know, roughly 12% higher than the 64 that it uh, registered in the month of June. Um, a lot of people reached out about the credit card debt figure. It came out last week that we've passed a trillion dollars in credit card debt. There were a couple of video or, or media excerpts I'd done in New York last week where this subject came up, and you may have seen some of those videos. Um, I'm not downplaying the fact that the credit card debt has gotten to that high of an absolute level, but I am pointing out that what you really are more interested in to get an economic indicator from it is the relative data. What is that debt relative to assets? What is that debt relative to income? And it's not even close to some of the levels that we'd seen in the past, like before the financial crisis. Um, debt service payments as a percentage of household income, that's a pretty relevant data. It sits a little below 10% right now. A, a little less than 10% of one's household income after tax is going towards service of debt. And that number was over 13% uh, previously uh, before financial crisis. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't take any of it as it's necessarily great, but I wouldn't take any of it as being unprecedentedly bad because it most certainly is not true. Check out the link in our housing and mortgage section at the DC Today, please. As far as the Fed goes, 88.5% chance right now in the futures market of no rate change next month at the September FOMC meeting a 61% chance of no change in November. So that means the odds go up to 39% that there will be a rate hike at the second uh, Fed, Fed meeting here in, in November. Uh, but pretty low odds for both right now. A lot more people than otherwise think the Fed is done. Um, Goldman Sachs over the weekend put out a report indicating their belief that the Fed will begin cutting rates in the second quarter of 2024. Um, there's so many brilliant people at Goldman, but I will say in my experience, I've talked about this before, oil prices, and then with um, rate projections, like most of the world, by the way, but Goldman has not had a great track record there either. So take it with a grain of salt. God knows the media is going to cover it. Um, remember, when Goldman talks, CNBC listens. Okay. Uh, out of the issues of the short-term Fed funds rate. What's the Fed going to do? Will they, won't they, when they, what will they do? The long end of the yield curve is really, I think, what is much more important in terms of indicating economic growth and expectations. And there are arguments that um, the long, you know, look, we were at 3.75% in the 10-year a month ago. We're at 4.1, 4.18 today. I'll get an updated number on that. Yeah, 4.18 right now. So, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that there are arguments that the long end could move higher. You have quantitative tightening still going on. Um, but ultimately, I think inflation's well off its peak. And I just think expected growth rates are very low. And for reasons I talk about over and over and over again, 
And that is basically my thesis for why I see downward pressure, not upward pressure on long end, uh, on long term bond rates. Uh, but that, that's an active debate right now. And I don't think that you're going to get a lot of rational discourse when the Fed is still raising rates, when the Fed still has a very high Fed funds rate, it's easier to make a prediction about the long end, you know, potentially going higher. When the Fed begins cutting and the long bond, if it never gets above 5%, it's pretty hard to call for a long end at five and a half when it couldn't do it when the Fed had the short end at five and a half. It's so <laughs> that's, I, I, that's my take. And all that is rooted in our belief about growth expectations. So uh, oil today, uh, you know, it's been in, in quite a move higher. Let's see, as I'm getting ready to wrap up here, oil is uh, down less than a buck. It's still at 82 and a half. So not a big move there with oil prices. But I just got to say that you're still talking about 400,000 barrels per day being produced less. Okay, that's, I can say this better than that. We are producing 400,000 barrels less now than we were before COVID you have about 40% less rigs active than you did in 2019. And obviously the Saudis have responded in kind. They're really controlling this oil price as we've surrendered so much of our own production capacity. Um, energy stocks, by the way, have had the biggest technical improvement last couple of months. You now have 75% of the sector at a three month high. You have 91% of the sector above its 200-day moving average. So there's been a lot of momentum that has moved uh, there with, with uh, oil stocks and gas-related. Speaking of which, natural gas prices are dead flat since late January. Um, you know, so you had a huge move down in, in beginning of January that had begun at the end of last year. And then, and then really they're flat now over a, a, what is that, a seven-month period of time. And, and yet you've had a pretty nice rally in natural gas stocks and energy stocks as of late without natural gas prices being responsible there. I think that that um, uh, uh, separation uh, in correlation from commodity prices is a very good thing. Against doomsdayism, the literacy rate uh, of the world in uh, the uh, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, was about 13%. And then by the end of that century, it had doubled and then another doubling from there. And lo and behold, we're now 83% of the world is literate. And a couple hundred years ago, it was 13%. Uh, to not appreciate that, it, uh, there's something wrong. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, but literacy just obviously is uh, talk about all the things we take for granted. Um, a really thoughtful question that I answer in the Ask David section today related to a follow-up from what we covered on um, Friday in the Dividend Cafe, further exploration around uh, dividend payments as a choice from the C-suite of companies and comparing some of that to stock buybacks. Check out the DC Today. Okay, so that's the scoop here. Uh, as I'm sitting here talking, uh, by now the market has closed and the Dow did end up up 26 points. S&P up 26 as well, uh, NASDAQ up 1%, and the rest of the numbers on sectors and bond yields will be in D.C. today. I got to run, but thank you so much for listening. Thank you for reading. Thank you for watching the D.C. today. Mm -hmm.